Hey, uh, my oldest daughter, Caitlin, is due today with our, with our fifth grandchild, and she's, she's due with a little girl, so we're going to have a little girl coming. We got, yeah, we got four grand boys, and um, we're about to have a granddaughter, a grand girl, and uh, so we're super, super excited about that, so pray for her. As I was thinking about this little girl, this sweet little girl that's coming uh, into our family, my greatest desire for her is that she would know Jesus all the days of her life. Not, and that's not just like a pastoral thing to say. That is like my, my heart for this little sweet thing. Um, we don't know her name yet. They probably do, but they never, they never let the, the name out until the kid's born. I don't know why that is. But, uh, so uh, in between services, in between services, I got this note from a six-year-old little man of God at our church, and um, this is what it says. Here it is in, in his little writing here. I'm, I'm going to read it to you. <laughs> And he's like, what's it say? Pastor Steve, I would like to get baptized because I would like to be like Jesus. Can I please get baptized at the chilly day at the park? Also, how old do I have to be so that I can help in Sunday school? <laughs> right? That's the kind of stuff right there. That's the stuff right there. This is going to be framed and put into my office. And uh, it will be up there uh, as among my important documents, so there we go. Jedediah Unger, that was the Unger's little boy, yeah. <clears throat> so we're going to be baptizing him um, at the park here uh, at, the, at the Chili Cook-Off. It's going to be really good. If you haven't been baptized and you'd like to get baptized, get baptized. Um, if you haven't signed up for one of the classes out there, sign up. I'm noticing that the women are, have out-signed up the men. What is up? Man, we gotta get we gotta step up. So when you go out there to the coffee, turn around and you'll see all of these tables ready to go. We've got, like Christy said, classes for everything and everyone under the sun. So check that out and be a part of it. There's some really good stuff going on. Um, kind of it goes along with what we're talking about today. Really, what we've been talking about uh, our, through our whole study of Proverbs. We're in Proverbs 19. We'll be in 13 chapter chapter 19 verses 13 through about 18 today. Titled the message today, Advice and Instruction for a Life of Wisdom and Fruitfulness. So the stuff we're talking about has the capacity to impact our whole lives and the generations that follow, as we've seen with this notes, and uh, as we just bring our kids up in the, in the fear and admonition of the Lord, as the scripture says, as we teach them, as we disciple them, as we model to them what it means to be a follower of Jesus. This type of stuff has the capacity to impact the generations. Uh, my prayer is that my, all of the generations that follow me would know Jesus all the way up to the, the, the second return of Christ. I, I'm just, I just want all of my family to know Jesus, and so that's what, that's what my prayer is. It, it takes effort, though. It takes uh, uh, it takes faith, it takes confidence in God and his word. Second Peter 3.18, Peter writes, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. With that, we're going to pray, and we're just going to, in fact, let's go ahead and stand up and pray. It feels like sometimes we need to do that. And so, Lord, as we stand, um, you have our full attention, Lord, and we want to give you our hearts and minds and give you our full attention today, Lord. So we, we ask, God, that as you speak, we would hear. As we uh, hear your direction, we'd say, yes, sir, and uh, we would do what you've called us to do, Lord. So be glorified in this time today. Speak powerfully to each person. Each of us is here in just a different season of life, dealing with different things. Some people are here just so excited to be here. Others are really struggling today, and I pray, God, that you'd bless each person Wherever it is that they may be, I just pray. We, we, we want you to do something sweet for each of us, Lord. And we want to respond to, with that sweet word and that sweet message, Lord, with uh, just gratitude and, and um, a heart to follow you. So be glorified as we do. Thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Proverbs 19. <clears throat> yeah, ca kind of kicking it off, though, with his First Peter 3 verse. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is Peter's counsel to us his instruction to us peter tells his reader this so that we will understand the times and so that we will continue to be on guard against the sway of the godless culture that has corrupted itself 
with sin. <clears throat> he wrote this 2,000 years ago. Things haven't changed much. We're still in a, a culture that is corrupted by st- sin. And instead of that, we should be pure, demonstrating godly behavior. We remain pure and able to demonstrate godly behavior when we continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Paul writes in Romans 12, too, he says, do not be conformed to this age. There's a difference between the, the, the ways of the world and the ways of God. And in this age, we have to be aware of what the enemy's up to and be on guard, but be transformed. He said, do, do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. We resist conforming to this age by the transformation that comes as our minds are renewed in the Word, the Word of God. When our minds are renewed by the Word, we have the ability to discern the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. This is how it works. How do we discern the will of God? We just, we just stay in His Word, and we stay filled with His presence, and we continue to stay in communication with Him, and we're just constantly asking Him, what is your will for this situation? What is your will for this fork in the road, for this decision in my life? What is your will for my life? What's the wisdom that I need for this decision? The theme for this study is actually in verse 20 of Proverbs 19. It says this, get all the advice and instruction you can, so you will be wise the rest of your life. And I've discovered that it's just a process throughout the course of our life that we continue to get advice and instruction, that we continue to grow the rest of our life as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're to get all of the advice and instruction we can so that we'll be wise the rest of our lives. God's not talking about becoming the smartest person in the room. He's not talking about just gathering up a bunch of information so that we've got it between our ears and so we've got this understanding. He's, he's giving us direction, encouraging us to gain knowledge and understanding, advice and instruction so that we might know how to live our lives as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he's not talking about becoming the smartest person in the room. Knowledge alone puffs up. It puffs us up and makes us proud. And And God's not interested in that. God resists the proud, gives grace to the humble. He's talking about gaining wisdom for a lifelong journey, walking with Jesus. He's talking about growing in knowledge of the ways of God and growing in wisdom and understanding, growing it with a sense of clarity regarding the things of God. We are to grow in wisdom. And then, and then as we grow in wisdom, we're to help others to grow in wisdom. That's really the whole discipleship model that Jesus put forth as he was getting ready to ascend. He said, he said go and make disciples, teaching them to obey everything that I command. Right? So disi- disciples who go and get people saved and then grounded in the word and those people who are saved and grounded in the word help others to get saved and grounded in the word that's the process the the reproductive model that god gave to us uh, before he ascended this is actually what we're supposed to be about and this is why our small group ministry and our bible school is all about helping people to know jesus and to follow jesus that's what we're about even in the social gatherings our purpose there is to help people connect to one another so that they can be strengthened in the fellowship of the saints and be encouraged to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ so that we can help others to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's really what we're all about as a church. It's what God's church is is, is commissioned to do. It's, it's, It's the purpose of the church. And so that's what we're all about. So we teach through Proverbs because we just need wisdom. I read through the Proverbs a bunch over the course of my life, and every time I read a new chapter, I'm like, hey, I needed that today. I, I needed that wisdom for my life. I, that spoke to, to me about something that I'm dealing with. So God's word has the power to, to, uh, to surgically penetrate and minister to us exactly, exactly, precisely where we need it. So we're in Proverbs 19, 13. The first half says, A foolish child is a calamity to a father. And that's closely connected to verse 18 in the same chapter. Proverbs 19, 18 says, Discipline your children. While there is hope. (laughs) Otherwise, you will ruin their lives. That's what the rest of the verse says. There's some weight to it. Discipline them while there is hope. Otherwise, you will ruin their lives. How do we discipline? 
I think it's always good to look at God's model for discipline, the way that God disciplines us, and then use that same model to discipline the children in our lives. We understand the heart of God, and we, we portray the heart of God when we discipline the way that he disciplines. Have you ever been disciplined by God? I have. It's kind of a rather uh, regular occurrence in my life. I don't mind saying, and I'm grateful for it. Let's look at Hebrews 12, 5 through 13, and see how God disciplines. God disciplines those whom he loves. Hebrews 12, 5 through 13 says this, and have you forgotten the encouraging words God spoke to you as his children? He said, my child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline, and don't give up when he corrects you, for the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes each one he accepts as his child so if you've been disciplined by the lord he's just demonstrating his love for you and his commitment to you as your father he's adopted you into his family and he cares about your path he cares about what you're doing so first principle discipline your child with love Love should drive everything that we do. Discipline your child with love. Be careful not to discipline out of anger. Sometimes we're just exasperated, though, right? We're like at our wits' end. Our kid has pushed every button that there is to push, and then some, and we're at the end of our ability to be logical, and so sometimes we discipline out of anger. We need to remember the way that God disciplines us and begin to course correct and begin to discipline out of anger love ask the lord how to do that as you're in these tense moments lord this kid is driving me crazy how do i discipline out of love god will give you the grace because i promise you we've also driven god crazy and he's figured out a way to discipline us with love he's just good that way be careful not to to discipline out of anger but do it out of love hebrews 12 7 says this as you endure this divine discipline remember that god is treating you as his own children Whoever heard of a child who was never disciplined by its father? If God doesn't discipline you as he does all of his children, it means that you are illegitimate and are not really his children at all. So first principle, discipline your child with love. Second principle, discipline with the right perspective. Sometimes we discipline because we're frustrated, and it's hard to have a good perspective when we're frustrated and exasperated we need to have the right perspective stepping back realizing that we're here to discipline with love with the right perspective but sometimes we discipline because we're frustrated and not because we have a plan to see our children grow into maturity and that's the perspective our perspective when disciplining our children is that we've got this vision this desire to see them grow into maturity that's why god disciplines us because he desires that we grow to a place of maturity all the days of our life so this is his perspective when he is disciplining you and when he's disciplining me he wants to see us grow in maturity becoming mature followers of his so in order to have that perspective we've got to develop a vision for our child's life as we look at our kids whether it's kids or grandkids or nieces or nephews what kind of vision do we have for them what's the the long range goal the long range goal and the long range perspective develop a vision for your child's life and then write it down and and, and just say lord maybe kind of what i shared in the beginning my, lord my desire for my grandkids is that they would always love you and i'm going to pray into that that's going to be my prayer all the days of their life i'm going to pray that they know you that they love you that they follow you because you're worth knowing and you're worth following what's your vision for your child's life and then what do you want to see happen in his or her life get a little more specific you say you want to pray that they have a godly spouse maybe you want to pray that they uh, discover their gifts and calling early in life because whether we go into full-time vocational ministry or not every one of us have have a calling a gift something that god has given to us to contribute to the kingdom so that we might be used within the kingdom of God. So what do we want to see? We want to see our kids developing those, discovering those things early in life. And then we ask ourselves the question, how will healthy discipline help that happen? So see how the perspective shifts? We're disciplining from love and from a healthy perspective, wanting the very best for our kids. Let's continue in Hebrews 12, verse 9. It says, since we respected our earthly fathers who disciplined us, shouldn't we submit even more to the discipline of the Father of our spirits and live forever 
For our earthly fathers disciplined us for a few years, doing the best they knew how. But God's discipline is always good for us. You hear that? God's discipline is always good for us. So that we might share in his holiness. Verse 11, no discipline is enjoyable while it's happening. We can't expect our kids to smile when we're disciplining them. In fact, if they're smiling as we discipline them, it's probably not real discipline, right? Because <laughs> no, discipline's not designed to be enjoyable. It's designed to be a teaching moment where we can teach our kids and train them up in righteousness. So no discipline is enjoyable while it's happening, happening and it's painful, it says. But afterward... There will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. (laughs) I remember getting disciplined as a kid. I'd say, Mom, I hate you, right? (laughs) We probably have heard that from your own kids. Ah! They they kind of lash out, right? That shouldn't deter us, right? We'll we'll take a little heat from our our kids for a moment so that they they can live a life of fruitfulness long term. We got to have this long term perspective disciplining out of love with the right perspective with the vision for their lives and um and then number three disciplining with a clear conscience and with understanding discipline is god's design to train us and to produce in us right living isn't that what we're doing with our kids we're trying to train them so they might live well in the earth right god we get that from the lord i think we get, all of our, all, we get all of our best stuff from God. <laughs> He's really, really capable. Verse 10 again, but God's discipline is always good for us so that we might share in his holiness. No discipline is enjoyable while it is happening. It's painful, but afterward, there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. So parents, grandparents, aunts and uncles, we need to practice this type of, of discipline it will go a long way as we're trying to raise trying to raise our kids up in the in the lord some of us are here though and we're like man i've been doing it all wrong <laughs> i've been doing it all. this is the glory of the gospel the beauty of the gospel every time we open up the word of god we have a chance to realign ourselves with god's plans with god's best with god's purposes for our life so we get to re- we get to repent as we respond to the gospel, to the message, and then we get to realign our lives with God. And so, uh, verse 12 and 13 of Hebrews 12 says, So take a new grip with your tired hands and strengthen your weak knees. Mark out a straight path for your feet so that those who are weak and lame will not fall but become strong. So, time to saddle back up. Time to find some new strength in the Lord. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Discipline with love, with the right perspective, with a clear conscience, and with understanding. And just watch what God will do. It's, it's a beautiful thing. Back to Proverbs 19, the second half, uh, 19, 13, the second half. Uh, second half of verse 13 says, A quarrelsome wife is as annoying as constant dripping. <laughs> I'm going to take a sip of my tea now. Just let that ruminate a bit. Let that settle in. Sometimes I get in trouble for reading what the Bible says, but I didn't write it. I'm just reading it out loud and letting the chips fall where they may. (laughs) A quarrelsome wife is as annoying as constant dripping. So verse 13 mentions two things that will make your home life very stressful. A child that is out of control and a wife that is quarrelsome both can be remedied that's the good news a child can and must be disciplined and a woman must be known for her gentle and quiet spirit peter said that i didn't say that (laughs) let's see what peter said first peter 3 3 and 4 peter tells women don't be concerned about the outward beauty that depends on fancy hairstyles, expensive jewelry, and expensive clothes. You should be known for the beauty that comes from within, the unfailing beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious to God. So this verse is asking women to be humble. This verse is asking women to be gentle, not 
overbearing. And this verse is asking women to be focused on her internal beauty more than on her external adornments. She can share her opinion with humility just like a man. Just like a man should. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. We all have a responsibility to be humble. One to another. Men and women, young and old, everyone in between, every one of us have a responsibility to treat and live, to treat one another and live in relationship one to another with humility. These verses are saying that a woman should be gentle, just like a man. Ephesians 4, verses 2 through 3, Paul tells us all. Paul speaks to the church, made up of men and women, in the church in Ephesus, then and now, he speaks to us all. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. The woman, just like the man, should be focused on internal beauty. We can all spend way too much time on external adornment, men and women, <laughs> right? We can all spend way too much time making sure the outside looks good, but neglecting our inner self. Listen to Paul's prayer for spiritual growth for the church at Ephesus in Ephesians 3, 16 through 19. This is Paul's prayer for the church then and now. I, I pray that from his glorious, unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirits. The word of God is all about what's going on internally. Everything flows from what's going on inside of us, and so God is focused there primarily. Inner strength produces inner beauty. So if you're struggling with inner beauty, like you got a lot of ugliness happening inside, then you need to strengthen your inner man, your inner woman, through the Word and through the Spirit. It's the only way to... It's the only way to right the ship. It's the only way to get your head and your heart in the right places. When, 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 you've chose, when, you've cho when you choose to live your lives according to the word of God, being filled with the spirit of God, living out of that experience as a follower of God. Inner strength produces inner beauty. When, when there's something of, of, of strength happening internally, spiritual st strength happening internally, all of a sudden the, the fruit of that, the outflow of that is beauty. It's, 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 beauty, it's beauty that God creates within us as he strengthen us, strengthens us as followers of his. Verse 17, Ephesians 3, Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in, in him. Your, your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. Why is Paul concerned about roots? Well, the roots are the important part. You don't see them, but it's the roots that uh, nourish and strengthen and sustain the, the plant, the tree. It's the roots that are the most important thing. You, you lop off the roots and everything else dies. So it's the roots, that stuff that's hidden that Paul's concerned about, that God's concerned about, that we need to be concerned about. What's going on internally? What's happening inside of our lives? We want our, our roots to grow down into God's love so that we might be strong. Verse 18, and may you have the power to understand as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it's too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Isn't that God's design that we'd be complete in him, growing in him, our roots growing deep into his love and grace? that we might, might have our lives transformed from the inside out. God is more concerned with our internal stuff. He's more concerned with our roots than our outward adornment. The external fades with time. Have you noticed that? <laughs> the external, it does, it fades with time. The internal 
can get better with time. And that's the beauty of following Jesus over the long haul. So we get older in the Lord. There's something beautiful that, ha- that can take place within our lives. And that's true of a marriage as well. The longer we're married, the potential for greater beauty and greater enjoyment is there. We have to work at it. We've got to make that our priority. The longer, the longer we, we're, we're with the Lord, we, is, a, is our priority to, to, to nurture that walk with him and to be in him and to abide with him. There's just such beauty that begins to flow out of that. The external fades with time. The internal can get better with time. So if you're frustrated that you're getting older, just wrap your arms around that reality. Say, you know what, I might be getting older, but by God's grace, I'm going I'm to continue to grow in him. I'm going to have greater faith, greater confidence. I'm, I'm going to work toward greater understanding so that I can be more obedient and honor him with my life. There's just something beautiful that, that happens over time as a person gets older. This is advice and instruction for a life of wisdom and fruitfulness, a, a lifetime of wisdom and fruitfulness. Proverbs 19, the next verse, verse 14 says, Fathers can give their sons an inheritance of houses and wealth, but only the Lord can give an understanding wife. What's more important? (laughs) Houses and wealth or an understanding wife? The truth is God and only God has the capacity to give the best gifts. We can pursue all kinds of stuff outside of him and find a little fulfillment and satisfaction, but God is the only one with the capacity to give the very best gifts. Fathers can only do so much for their children. The best stuff comes from God. So the best thing we can do as dads and granddads is to lead our kids to Jesus. This plan, this decision will take a lifetime of diligence and vision, but as we commit our lives For a lifetime to this worthy goal, we will see our kids and grandkids come to faith by God's grace. We will watch them enjoy Jesus and come to Jesus and live for him. If you're lazy about it, though, you won't get the job done. Verse 15, Proverbs 19 says this, Lazy people sleep soundly, but idleness leaves them hungry. So regarding laziness, let's look at Proverbs 6, 6 through 11. We get some good advice there. It says, take a lesson from the ants, you lazy bones. <laughs> Learn from their ways and become wise. Though they have no prince or governor or ruler to make them work, they labor hard all summer gathering food for the winter. All summer long, we battle ants out at our property. All summer long, we, we try to dispatch of the ants. That's, that's another word for killing them. We try to kill the ants. And we kill a few, but they just harbor underground, they go underground, and they pop up somewhere else, and all of a sudden we see more ants. And uh, they are diligent, hard at work all summer long, gathering food so that they can endure the winter. But you, lazy bones, verse 9, how long will you sleep? When will you wake up? A little extra sleep, a little more slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, then poverty will pounce on you like a bandit. Scarcity will attack you like an armed robber. So laziness produces poverty and scarcity. The Bible is constantly, God is constantly trying to point us to a better way of life for now and for eternity. This is God's design in giving us his spirit and his word. This is God's design in coming to the earth and uh, living and dying and resurrecting for us so that we might have life eternal, so we might have a better life. He's come that we might have life abundant here and for eternity. God is constantly trying to point us to a better way of life for now and for eternity. That's good news. Proverbs 19, 16 it says, keep the commandments and keep your life. Despising them leads to death. So we're encouraged throughout the scripture to remember the commandments and to obey the commandments, to keep the commandments. The wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. In Deuteronomy 6, 
4 through 9, Moses writes, Listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. Heart, soul, strength, that's everything. That's your whole being right there, heart, soul, everything. This is how we're supposed to love the Lord, with everything we got. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I am giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you are at home and when you are on the road, when you are going to bed and when you are getting up. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. In other words, in other words all the time, just make it a point of conversation. When your relationship with your kids, just talk about this, uh, the seasons of your life. For us, uh, our kids growing up, they were, they were just always in church on Sunday morning, even before I was a pastor. I, we actually used to go to church every Sunday before I was a pastor. Novel idea, right? Now I have to be here, but... <laughs> but even before I had to be here, I still made church a priority. So now my kids growing up, my youngest to my oldest, they're all growing up now and out of college and having kids of their own, and they all still want to be in church on Sunday morning, just, just kind of in them, you know? We tried to share our Christian experience, our walk with them just throughout the course of their lives, and so we would talk about difficult seasons that we were in and point them to the faithfulness of God, even in the difficulty of it all. And then when we get outside of that difficult season, we point to what God did to see us through all of that. We just wanted them to walk through all of it with us so that they'd understand what it means to follow Jesus when things are good and when things are not so good. We shared with them our, our financial uh, picture. We shared with them that, we, that tithing was a priority to us as a family. And so we'd show them. We'd write 10% of our income to write a, church, a check to the church, and we just made it a part of the conversation. It wasn't weird. Any more than just deciding to serve in the church was weird. It wasn't weird. It was just because it's just what we did. It was who we were. We weren't trying to put on a show. It was just the deal. And so now my kids, they show up to church, they serve, and they tithe, and they're imperfect as your kids are imperfect but <laughs> but we were able to instill a few things right none of our kids are going to be perfect right because none of us are perfect but we can have an influence and we're meant to have an influence parents you've got the biggest impact potential on your kids grandparents you got the second biggest impact potential what are we passing along to them what are we choosing to pass along? It's a choice, right? What kind of conversations are we having with our kids so that they understand what it means to follow Jesus? So they understand what it means to trust Jesus and love Jesus, even when it feels like things are harder than they should be or things are unfair. How do we walk through all of that with our kids so that they see the genuineness of our faith and the genuineness of our conviction. We just have conversations about it, not in a weird, overbearing way that turns their hearts away from Jesus. We're not talking about that. We're talking about in just a natural, healthy way that turns their hearts toward Jesus so that they too fall in love with the Lord as they grow up. We want our kids to fall in love with Jesus like we fall in love with Jesus. Keep the commandments and keep your life despising them leads to death we need to have conversations like that with our kids we must do this for ourselves and we got to help our kids do this god's got a good plan for our life and he's always pointing us to that plan verse 17 as we get ready to wrap up here shortly says if you help the poor you are lending to the lord and he will repay you sometimes we feel helping the poor is like throwing resources away i was downtown San Louis last week and I saw this young man and he was in need of some help and uh, my heart went out to him and uh, in hindsight I, I probably should have helped him but I thought you know there's people all over the city who have needs and I, I can't help everyone so I just kept walking and did not help him if we feel led by the Lord to help someone we just need to step out and do it and let the Lord handle uh, and or you know worry about the income or the outcome excuse me income and outcome <laughs> both I Freudian slip there let God worry about the outcome 
The Bible tells us that whatever we do to the least of these, we are actually doing to the Lord. And so God's going to challenge us sometimes to step outside of our comfort zone and give to those in need. Only we can accurately judge what God is asking us to do, but God knows what he's asked us to do. And and if we're honest, we know at times like this last week, I, I didn't do what I was asked to do. And so I'm learning through the process. And uh, my hope is next time I will do what he asked me to do. We do what we do is, as we do it uh, for others uh, as unto the Lord. Matthew 25, 31 through 46, we're going to wrap up with the reading of this passage of Scripture, and it's titled, The Final Judgment. It says, But when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit upon his glorious throne All the nations will be gathered in his presence, and he will separate the people as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Then the the king will say to those on his right, come, come you who are blessed by my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world, for I was hungry and you fed me. And I, I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me into your home. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you cared for me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then these righteous ones will reply, Lord, when, when, when did we ever see you hungry or, and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink or a stranger and show you hospitality or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick Or in prison and visit you. And the king will say, Jesus will say, I tell you the truth. When you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. That's sobering for me to read. Verse 41. Then the king will turn to those on the left and say, away with you. Away with you, you cursed ones. Into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his demons, for I was hungry. And you didn't feed me. I was thirsty, and you didn't give me a drink. I was a stranger, and you didn't invite me into your home. I was naked, and you didn't give me clothing. I was sick and in prison, and you didn't visit me. Then they will reply, Lord, when? When did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and not help you? And he will answer, I tell you the truth. When you refused to help the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were, ref- you were refusing to help me. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous will go into eternal life. Advice and instruction for a life of wisdom and fruitfulness. I love the gospel because it gives us opportunity to repent. <laughs> we come to Jesus through this broken place of contrition and and repentance and then as we read the scripture and we realize hey there's some things that aren't lining up we get a chance to repent again and it's a lifestyle really it's a lifestyle of repentance god gives us the opportunity to repent over and over again so that we might align our lives with him we're going to invite the worship team back up and then this second set of worship is called the response and so we just get to respond to what we've heard and and um, realign our lives with the plans and purposes of god it's it's what we do all the days of our lives. As we read the scripture and as we hear from the Lord, we, we make the decision to align ourselves with him. So as the worship team come forward, we're going to have you stand. And I'm going to pray. And then as we worship, respond to the Lord. And as we worship, we're going to have the elders pass the bags and collect tithes and offerings. And so if you want to participate in that, that would be great as well. So Lord, we, we thank you for your word that it continually... Uh, reveals truth to us so that we might realign our lives with you that's what it's all about that's all we want to be about lord so help us to be focused on that stuff lord and thank you it's a form of discipline thank you that you discipline those whom you love those whom you call your own so we receive it with joy we receive it with um with gratitude and we we respond to it with humility and we respond to it with obedience So thank you, Lord, for this time, and we love you, Lord, and we just pray that as we respond, God, that you'd be glorified, and as we sing, it would would be with all of our hearts. Thank you for this time. We love you. We bless you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.